set at 10 to 30 percent of public expenditures, in some countries even more. That means that uh, in some countries of every dollar you spend on a public project, half of it is being siphoned off by the cartel in the form of an excessive price uh, or related uh, lower quality. Uh, all of this, I think, points in the direction of more robust private initiative in the form of whistleblowing projects. Uh, and uh, a couple of ideas that, that echo uh, John's comments before about how to do this. And I'm drawing mainly from experience that's been developed in the United States uh, under a program called the False Claims Act, which deals with the expenditure of public funds and the Dodd-Frank securities reforms of 2010, 2011, that also created a whistleblowing scheme. Through these, a lot of what I would call legal technology and know-how has been developed, tested, uh, we have a better idea of what works and what doesn't work. And sadly, in the US, we have not really imported this directly into the competition law system. So in speaking about it with our group, I'm not simply making a pitch for broader global adoption. I'm making a pitch for my own country to think about this in more detail. What have we learned? Uh, first, John mentioned this. The payoffs to the individual must be substantial. And in the United States, under the False Claims Act system, the rewards for the whistleblower range from between roughly 10% of all funds the government ultimately recovers to up to 35%. This has created a large number of individuals who do become millionaires. Why is this important? It recognizes that if you blow the whistle, you are blowing up your career. And you have become radioactive in the eyes of many employers. And this essentially has to be the pension-like parachute that may have to carry you through the rest of your living days. Uh, so it cannot be a cheap reward, a coupon for a free pizza. It's got to be something that truly resonates. It's got to be a powerful reward. And if you have the powerful award, that will elicit effort. A second takeaway from this technology and know-how, I would create a system that has a private representation by lawyers with a provision that the attorney's fees of the lawyers are paid by the wrongdoer. Uh, this exists in the False Claims Act mechanism in the US, and the result has been the development of a private bar that acts on behalf of individuals. They publicize their availability. It means that you have a legal expert side by side with you to guide you through the process and deal with the intimidating complexity of a regime that might discourage individual initiative and to help you engage anti-retaliation safeguards, which are also an important element of this process. Um, so I would say that the two must have effort elements are first, uh, a powerful incentive for the individual to act um, and a representation mechanism that provides the creation of a private sector group of legal specialists who do these cases uh, and someone who can assist in the guidance of, of, the, of the individual in the process. And third, uh, an anti-retaliation mechanism. Um, but in, in identifying the importance of the reward, I'm assuming that this person is going to be marginalized anyway. And for a variety of reasons, may not want to continue to work in the company and they might be knocked out of the industry because every time you go in for an interview, you will have pinned on your chest, whistleblower, troublemaker, disruptor, radioactive. Uh, those are all reasons that the reward has to be a powerful, powerful one. Uh, closing thought, uh, how do we keep companies from doing this in the future? Having a better whistleblower regime is a powerful disruptive force because every time you run a cartel or collusive scheme involving say public procurement, you're going to have to engage a number of people inside the firm, including people who are subordinates. What happens if you thought that every person sitting in that room might walk in and call you in, walk out and call you in, might invoke the legal provisions against you? That makes it more difficult to run your cartel and it may discourage you from doing it in the first place. Beyond that, I think it would be nice to have as part of the competition policy process where you have serious violations and misconduct, I would like for there to be an obligation on the part of the company to determine how it happened. Why did it occur? What was the machinery by which the decisions were taken? Who took the decisions and very important, 
what governance reforms is the company going to put in place to see to it that it doesn't happen again? This would be the equivalent of the transportation accident reconstruction that always takes place with serious transport accidents to go back and figure out how did it happen, what caused the problem, and how do we avoid its reoccurrence in the future? In short, there's some very good models from across the range of public experience today and a jurisdiction that wants to enhance its regime or to set it up for the first time does not have to enter, uh, enter new terrain. There's a lot of existing know-how and technology for setting this up and trying it out. And of course, you can start with one mechanism, you can enhance it. There are lots of opportunities to learn and grow the system over time. Thanks, Andreas. Thank you, Bill. And uh, we are already getting responses to your, to your uh, discussion points that you just raised. And for instance, Bianca Goodson, the, the whistleblower in the uh, South mm -hmm. African uh, state capture uh, scandal that I mentioned earlier before your discussion points, uh, Bill just said online here, and I'm reading, uh, Professor Kovacic, I agree with your position. I really wish that South Africa would consider your recommendations. And I'm sure so do many. And uh, especially Johannes, um, who, uh, who I think uh, will give us a, a, a little uh, overview of what he experienced. I wonder if he considered himself radioactive as well after he blew the whistle on the fish rod. But before I hand it over to you, Johannes, I briefly want to introduce Mary. Um, our our co-host, our, our co-hostess uh, from uh, the law firm of Constantine Cannon, who are co-sponsoring this event. Uh, sorry, Mary, I hadn't seen you earlier. You were kind of hidden on my screen. I don't know how how long ago you dialed in, but uh, I hope you heard you heard all of uh, John's and Bill's uh, uh, informative remarks. Mm -hmm. uh, Mary Inman is a, a partner at Constantine Cannon. She is uh, of uh, United States extraction, but currently based in uh, London. Well, currently, I don't know where you are, Mary, but overall, technically, you are a resident uh, partner in the London office of the firm, if I understand correctly, and uh, where, where we have visited you a couple of times. And uh, Mary is an experience, probably among the, the members of this panel and possibly the entire audience, the most experienced uh, attorney when it comes to uh, protecting and representing whistleblowers um, worldwide uh, and has, has several big wins uh, under her belt when it comes to uh, recovering money, as John and Bill just pointed out, for whistleblowers under the False Claims Act uh, as well as other regimes, including, uh, you know, I think the SEC, they just announced that there was a multi, multi-million dollar reward paid out to one of uh, her clients who was a whistleblower. So welcome, Mary. We will hand you the mic after Johannes uh, presents. Johannes, uh, you are, as I said earlier in introducing you, the actual whistleblower mm -hmm. on the ground. You're not a lawyer, you're a businessman, a former businessman, a current businessman, but certainly a former businessman involved to some degree in a corrupt, um, activity and you blew the whistle. You did the right thing uh, morally, as we might all agree, and you blew the whistle, you reported it. Uh, tell us how it happened and what happened and what your thoughts are. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Andreas. And, uh, and uh, I would just uh, have up uh, sm my small presentation and I would just put that up and uh, go over the points as we, we discussed. Uh, you see it? Yes, we see it. Thank you. Okay, very good. Yeah, good day all. My name is Johannes Stevason. I'm the whistleblower in the fish rod corruption. And uh, just want to put on the slides. Uh, here, I'm just going to go briefly over the over the, the fish rod, uh, you know, the, the key, key facts about the fish rod cases. Uh, I worked for the Icelandic uh, fishing company Samheri, which is uh, quite one of the biggest in, in the world. And uh, they, just to give you numbers, you know, they had the estimated turnover in Namibia from 2012 to 2019, uh, 450, 500 million US dollar. Uh, they claim they have lost 7 million US dollar during this period, but you know, that is mostly due to that, uh, their tax avoidance schemes, which we will see more information coming uh, soon, I assume. 
the suspected bribe payments are now around 15, 20 million US dollars to, to the so-called sharks, which are the corrupt uh, individuals they were working with in Namibia. Uh, just to give you a little bit idea, you know, the Financial Intelligence Unit in Namibia just recently reported around 650 million US dollars flagged as suspicious transactions related to fish rules. In, in Namibia, they have forfeit a fishing vessel of 20 million US dollars, bank accounts, assets, cars, and etc. And uh, then there is also another corrupt uh, schemes uh, which involve Samheri, uh, and that is that uh, they worked with the local quota holders from uh, 2013 to 2018. Uh, today, it's estimated, uh, estimated several hundreds of million US dollars which has been taken out by Samheri and for the pockets of the sharks, which are the corrupt elites in, uh, in Namibia and all the related parties in, uh, in Namibia because, you know, we, we call them the, the corrupt elite in Namibia is definitely involved as we also seen a lot in the news this year. The biggest players in the official corruption uh, are, uh, are Samari and the Sharks and uh, plus, other cor plus the corrupt elite in Namibia and all the related parties. Uh, currently, there are seven fish rod suspects in jail in Namibia, including two former ministers, and they have uh, six of them have been in the jail since end, uh, end of November last year. There are six uh, fish rod suspects who hold a status uh, hold a status of suspect in Iceland, and uh, I'm one of them because you know even though I came forward in Iceland, there is no whistleblower protection uh, law. Uh, just to go a little bit on the on the. The highlight of uh, my experience to, to expose a lot of corruption in, include in, involving African country and uh, European country. What, uh, what I say is one of the biggest highlights is that uh, I was quite lucky. I think, you know, I met the right investigators and investigators in Namibia. And uh, we have seen a great work uh, for, by the investigators and prosecutors in Namibia, despite all the challenges and obstacles. I mean, I often say we are against superpowers. And, uh, and uh, when I went to Namibia in August 2018, then uh, we found the comfort and trust with that we met the right people. And I give them a big credit how professional and discreet they have been about everything and how well they have handled and they took on the case. Even, uh, the, even though in this meeting I revealed a lot of high profile names. Um, I, in my also one of the highlights is that the investigators and prosecutors in Namibia have set the st standard much higher for other countries in the world, you know, including European countries. They, they have worked very well and aggressively. And as I say, they are facing a lot of obstacles and challenges. And uh, this is a constant uh, fight for them. And um, this is uh, definitely one of the top highlights in my experience, you know, because I could have met the wrong people. And nothing would have happened. And uh, just to give you an idea, when I went to report the cases in August 2018, uh, my brother, which I call my brother and protector. With that said, I, I'd like to turn it over to Mary Inman uh, from Constantine Cannon, and who introduced us to you kindly, and uh, get her take on, on what she's heard so far and what uh, you think, Mary, uh, should be done uh, in furtherance of, of disclosing corrupt activities by individuals such as Johannes and, and such as uh, Bianca. Thank you, uh, Andreas, and thanks everybody. Um, I appreciate my co-host here at Primario. I'm really glad we pulled this together. Thank you so much, Johannes, for your time. And Bianca, we're delighted that you're listening in the audience. Um, so what I've heard so far is everything Bill Kovacic said, of course, I agree with. Um, he is talking about what has happened in the United States in terms of our um, whistleblower reward laws has really allowed law firms like myself to spring up and support and do the hard work of basically taking a whistleblower's information and making sure it gets in the hands of the proper government authorities. I want to pause here and say that when I moved to London three years ago, I think I was not aware that the North American approach is fairly different in terms of paying rewards from the European approach. So the European approach, is, in fact, I think is much better than we are in certain aspects, certainly with a new EU directive, in having retaliation protection laws, umbrella laws that cover everything. In the United States, we've been very reactive in our whistleblower retaliation protection provisions. We have SOX, which arose out of the Enron scandal. 
We have Dodd-Frank giving a whistleblower program, but protections there. We don't have a uniform protection system. We could be much better. We need to learn from our European colleagues. But what we are phenomenally good at is the other piece, right? Because retaliation is looking retrospectively. Someone like Johannes is happy to have an employment lawyer help that help him deal with the fact that he was uh, wrongfully terminated, he was retaliated against. But that's only looking retrospectively. What the American and North American programs do, because our Canadian brethren up north do have similar programs, um, is that it, it provides the ability for Johannes to get his information to the, he, he didn't blow the whistle for no reason. He blew the whistle because he wanted someone to act upon it. I think it's very interesting in his story that the Namibians seem to be acting on it, but maybe not the Icelandic and Norwegian uh, countries, which is a you know, topic for a whole different presentation. But what we're good at is getting it to the agencies. And I think one of the things that has concerned me is that once you get it there, right, the whistleblower only receives a reward if the prosecuting authority, whether it's the DOJ or in the SEC or IRS, if they actually take the information and impose a fine or settle, have a settlement with the wrongdoer. So part of my concerns, as much as I love whistleblower reward programs, is that I'm not sure it's and I think it's incredibly important for people like Bianca and Johannes who've given up everything, right? It's not just that this one employer, Samarji is not gonna employ him again. It's that he's radioactive in Bill's term. It has career long blacklisting. So that's really what our whistleblower rewards seek to do. It's not a bounty, what it is, although it's sometimes referred to, it's basically an insurance policy to sit under a whistleblower to protect them for the career long loss. So, but you can only get that reward if you have a progress, if you have a very aggressive prosecutorial authority. And so part of what I worry about is that while the Americans can be and the SEC in particular DOJ are very aggressive in prosecuting, I'm not sure that's true of every country. So look at Johannes' situation. Do we think that if there had been Icelandic reward pr provision or a Norwegian one, would they have actually gone after um, the companies and actually impose a fine. So that's the that's sort of the dilemma I, I, I face. And one of the things where I worry that I don't want reward programs to be there only to have and, and to entice folks like Johannes and Bianca to step forward only to have the information not used. So I think that's one of the challenges we face. Um, but I think what we've realized is that folks like Johannes and Bianca have, you know, the, I think there's a cultural divide in terms of how we deal with rewarding whistleblowers. My experience in the UK has been that people publicly do not like the idea of paying whistleblowers for information because they think that it, I think it's a very American notion that because it's coming from America and they think we're mercenary, that, you know, oh, Americans, you have to pay people to do the right thing. We're British, we do it because we speak up just because it's the right thing to do. We don't need to be rewarded. But then you look at people like Johannes and the number of uh, British whistleblowers I've met and they say, I wish that I had that safety net under me. I wish. And so part of what we have seen is a rush of, because you do not have to be an American to use the American whistleblower reward programs. We've seen a rush of international and British um, whistleblowers coming to us to try and use the American programs. And I think that is in response to the fact that the Financial Conduct Authority, SFO, have not been as aggressive in certain taking certain actions and certainly don't provide the reward mechanism. And so my response to people in the UK who say it's culturally inappropriate is then why are British whistleblowers banging down my door? So um, I definitely want to leave plenty of time for questions because I know Sophia and Bianca are in the audience. Um, but I think I would just like to end us with an example, because I totally agree with Bill that it's ironic that, that the United States government does not have a reward program um, for uh, under the um, competitions authority, the FCC um, in the US, whereas we should have one. But I did want to say that our firm is really successful in getting, and, and it sort of, to me, this crystallizes the expansion of the US programs globally. We have a South Korean um, whistleblower who exposed a bid rigging he was in. He did engage in cartel busting. And the reason we in the United States were able to help 
um, this whistleblower is we brought a false claims act because the victim was the United States government. So the false claims act applied, but what happened is there was a cartel in South Korea when the defense department put up a contract to supply fuel to the military bases, the US military bases in Korea, that all of the, the oil and gas companies engaged in bid rigging. Our client um, actually happened to be the brother-in-law of one of the oil and gas companies um, and he brought that information forward at great risk to himself. We, he cooperated with the FBI and we attained with the DOJ's assistance a $363 million settlement. The whistleblower himself received $37 million. What he suffered was that you can imagine uh, he lost his wife and uh, basically his family for uh, basically being perceived as being a traitor to his family, can no longer live in South Korea and really has to uproot his life. So questions like that are, you know, does a $37 million award seem extreme? My answer would be not for career long loss, not for having to lose your family and basically relocate to another country. These are important points, Mary, and, and thank you for, for that overview and that other example also. I mean, you know, family, if you're losing, you're losing uh, you know, family members over this, you know, destroying your family ties, truly the question is, can that even be compensated with money or not, right? It's, 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 uh, it's horrific, and yet people do the right thing, just like Johannes. Um, uh, going back to your point about Bill and the antitrust laws, it, it is interesting, and, and Bill, before I give the mic back to you, I do want to get every, every panel member on, but, but I'll just put a little placeholder there. It is interesting that in the competition law, also known as antitrust sphere, the protections almost everywhere, not just in the US, not just in South Africa, but everywhere are simply that, well, if you are a successful leniency or amnesty applicant, which means you blew the whistle, either as an individual or a company, on a price fixing cartel, for instance, the only benefit you get, as, as John Oxenham put it, the only carrot you get is that we don't put you in jail, that we don't impose a criminal fine on you. It's sort of a, a reverse carrot, right? It's, it's fine, we won't punish you for the illegal conduct that you have participated in, but we're not giving you anything extra. You don't come out, come out ahead. You don't have the, as Mary put it, the safety net or the insurance policy of extra money for your likely future lost income. So that is really interesting that uh, that that in, in our area of law there, uh, we really don't have that. But let's uh, 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 close out the, the, the introductory round here with uh, Khadija Sharif, um, who uh, again, and I, I have to correct myself, she is not a member of a board of an entity at Yale. She is a, uh, she is merely, in, in quotation marks, a fellow at Yale, which is in my book still, uh, still quite, uh, quite, quite an honor. Um, uh, and, and it's not the uh, Skulls and Bones Society either. Uh, I, think, I think they're pretty famous there at Yale. Uh, but Khadija, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, please, Khadija, tell us about your organization PLAF, P-P-L-A-A-F, also known as PLAF, and uh, your work in this area. Thank you. Um, so the organization was set up by advocate William Badun, who had been representing Edward Snowden, the whistleblowers behind LuxLeaks and SwissLeaks and so forth. And we came together because uh, I come from an investigative journalism background, and William wanted to provide legal, a free legal defense to whistleblowers in Africa or who made disclosures involving Africa. And so the organization was founded from that, and uh, through it we've been able to meet some of the most incredible people like Johannes and Bianca who have really taken this monumental burden upon themselves that should actually have been placed on lawmakers and policymakers but instead they were required by virtue of their conscience to step forward. Uh, so one of the things I just wanted to very quickly clear up is while we call them whistleblowers, I, I don't think it really captures the sacrifice because it paints a picture of someone who's making a loud or a large disclosure. And it's largely a juridical term in most African countries. You know, the concept is more of snitching or an impimpi, which is a very derogatory uh, concept and context. And even though governments and corporate companies claim to support accountability, they capitalize on the PR and never actually back the position. So Bianca and Johannes will struggle perhaps forever to find 
uh, a decent job to get their lives back on track because there's always a push towards transparency but never towards accountability and sometimes transparency is the Trojan horse that distracts from accountability. Um, so with people like Bianca and Johannes, they actually come from a place of bearing witness. You know, their conscience demands this release of a harm or a wrong done against the public good, whether it's a small disclosure involving one person or a tree or the broader society and a forest. But in doing so, they're kind of pushed out of society or they have to step outside of it because society tends to conform and to follow the rules and to not want to stand out. And so they often become some of the loneliest people in the world they lose their families, they lose their incomes, and the distillation of that act of, uh, of disclosing information um, ends up freezing them in that moment forever. So they're never free, and they are always, always kind of in a, in a suspended reality where their lives are just stuck while journalists can get awards and companies can make money. And like KPMG, you give donations to a few civil society uh, uh, nonprofit entities, and suddenly you can buy your reputation back. So that is the big contradiction and con inconsistency between the people who are required to be the canaries in the gold mine and everyone else that happens to you know, bounce back quite quickly. So uh, Johannes has spoken about Namibia, and uh, if Bianca has time, maybe she can touch on South Africa. But this is a, a phenomenon that's continental, you know, in Zimbabwe, arguably one of the worst regional countries. Uh, it's not just the lack of a whistleblowing law. It's the Official Secrets Act that was inherited from colonialism. It gives 20 years of imprisonment if any official data is disclosed, you know, without the government's approval. Uh, and common law has not explicitly criminalized any corruption or wrongdoing, only certain aspects of it. So even Zimbabwe's anti-corruption agency will say, you know, unless the law says it is criminal, it is not criminal, whatever you might think of it. In Botswana, considered one of the better countries in the region, section 47 and 48 of the penal code, vests the president of Botswana with absolute power in whatever is published, the right to prohibit, the right to imprison. So a country that's considered more or less peaceable and harmless is actually uh, bears the same very predatory legal infrastructure that allows for a coercive sovereign state to crack down when and if they see fit. In Swaziland, the Cape Libel Act of 1882, also inherited from colonialist times, allows for the same thing, a prison sentence, if anything confidential or official is published, that may defame the royal court, a politician. The, several of our colleagues have mentioned is, you know, what, what do you do if the government is timid or is actually part of the, part of the misconduct itself? Uh, what if you can't trust the prosecutor? Uh, at worst, what if the prosecutor uh, relays your information to the wrongdoers and assist them in crushing you. So uh, if you're not fortunate like Johannes to have supportive uh, investigators and prosecutors, uh, what do you do about that? Uh, one, one approach that uh, is incorporated into the False Claims Act in the United States is that the, the, uh, the whistleblower uh, represented by attorneys uh, only gives the government the right of first refusal with the case. Uh, that is, the government has an opportunity to take or not take the case, but there's a private right of action as a fallback. Uh, and the uh, privately represented individual can then go to court and pr pursue the case. Now, that, of course, assumes that the courts are legitimate, well-functioning enterprises. Uh, that right of first refusal and the ability to go directly into court has been very important in the U.S. scheme because a concern that one has uh, in going to the public authorities is, will they regard this as a problem to be corrected through remediation, uh, or will they see this as a problem to be addressed simply by suppressing uh, the, the, the informant uh, and by uh, circling arms around the, the challenged institution or private actor. Uh, but one way, to, one way to seek to address that is to ultimately give the aggrieved party the opportunity to move directly into court and to prosecute the case on their own, in effect, on behalf of the, of the, of the, of the public institution as well. I think the larger uh, dispiriting problem uh, that uh, uh, many of us have been talking about is uh, what do you do when public institutions are so shot through with, uh, with corruption that uh, there's no public institution you can really trust? Uh, either because, again, they are part of the corrupt enterprise or because of their own expectations, timidity, other concerns, these official secrets acts are, uh, are a real scourge and it's a great, great concern to raise. 
What if for a variety of reasons, they are simply not going to act on your behalf? Uh, it seems to me this does put a real burden on international organizations and individual countries in bilateral relationships to use the power that they have, the control over finance, the control over trade, uh, the control over lending, grants, uh, to demand uh, certain conditions as a, as, a, as a condition of dealing. Uh, that is, they are in a position step by step uh, to demand certain adjustments in public administration as a condition for participation in markets, uh, uh, participation in loan programs. Uh, in a number of instances, uh, an indispensable element of the solution, I think, has to come in the form of dealing with international, the, 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 the large international bank and assistance institutions, bilateral programs. They have to be involved in coming up with the longer term, longer term solutions. Uh, last thing I'd mention is the, you know, the point that, uh, that, that, again, several of you made, uh, Mary, quite vividly, is what do you do with cultural and social expectations uh, that treat the individual who comes forward as a pariah? Uh, I don't ultimately know that there is a solution to that, uh, except to try to identify the consequences of, a letting, of allowing a, a serious uh, economic and public institutional disease to persist and to pose the question, uh, do you, are you, are you, would you prefer as a society uh, to have deep-seated, costly uh, 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 misconduct uh, that robs you day in and day out uh, from precious resources? Would you prefer to have that persist? Uh, and if your answer is yes, as a society, I guess there's not much we can do about that. But if you'd like to have all of the improvements that you could get otherwise, then you have to take this into, into account. But I, 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 think, I think on these lines, uh, there's no way to sugarcoat the fact that someone who stands out and challenges will suffer. And perhaps Mary's right that the best thing you can try to do is to alleviate the suffering with a measure of financial security. Uh, but it will, you can, the, as, as everyone who's gone through this knows, a, a, a great society is not going to step forward and say, thank you for helping out. There's the opportunity instead that they will say, you inflicted harm on us through your actions and we disapprove. Uh, and I think there's no way to avoid that sad consequence in many instances, even though many of us after the fact would look at that intervention and say, thank goodness they did it. Right. And notably again for our audience members, uh, uh, this comes from uh, uh, Bill, Bill Kovacic who is the only one among us here on the panel who is a present and past enforcer, uh, law enforcement uh, official through the FTC and the Competition Markets Authority. So that's a that's a sobering note that you're that you're putting out there, Bill. And, and you know some of these uh, uh, problems faced by whistleblowers and the culture cultural aspects may not even have a solution. That is that is a, a sobering perspective. However, well, there or are it happens, or it happens over a, a painfully slow, long process. Right. Uh, that is uh, that that moves like a glacier and uh, and doesn't provide visible, immediate positive feedback. Right. And and I think another uh, lesson there also from what Johannes said uh, about, you know, having to return back to Namibia um, to to uh, participate in the trial in the in the uh, 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 legal process there as a witness is, uh, you know, uh, what is the status legally of you as a whistleblower in your own country? What is the status of you as a whistleblower in the country where the illicit conduct occurred and or where you reported it, right? Uh, the concept of asylum, I don't know who raised it. I think um, it may have been Khadija or Mary. The concept of asylum for whistleblowers is a, is a fascinating topic that I had not thought of thus far. But uh, uh, perhaps as Bill just said, uh, all of these issues are perhaps most easily resolved with uh, Mary's answer, which is money, right? Money is the only fungible and practical element that can be used anywhere in the world, right? Uh, we don't need to address cultural differences. We don't need to address different asylum laws in different countries. We don't need to address different standards of proof in different courts in different countries. If you get enough money wherever you are, if you blow the whistle rightfully, uh, if you get rewarded, 
you can end up living hopefully anywhere in the world where you feel safe. That that may be the sort of short answer. Uh, Johannes, uh, do you have any uh, any thoughts on uh, on what the other panelists have have elaborated on? No, I mean, I, mean, uh, I think it have been very, very good points for all, and it's also very educational also to learn more and more, you know, even, you know, it's two years since I, I came forward, and uh, I'm still learning. I'm still learning exactly where, where I'm standing, what are the challenges, and also, I mean, with all the all the stories and, you know, to look at what other whistleblowers are doing, and, you know, as we have seen, the, the very brave acts of... Uh, Bianca Kutson, you know, how, how, what she has gone through and, and the, how bravely she blew the whistle, you know. So, I mean, uh, this is all very, very educational and also just to, for me, is, I'm realizing better and better, you know, what huge criminal activities I was in. And uh, I think also with, uh, with the presentation of uh, Katja Sheriff is very, very impressive and also gives us a very good insight of, uh, of uh, how things are working in so many African countries and with this old law, with the disclosing information, etc., you know, you can end up in long uh, prison. And that is also, I have read some of the law also in, similar to this in Namibia, uh, which relates to some, some parties. And uh, this is very, very concerning and worry, worrying. And I, I think, I mean, uh, probably not many know these things as, uh, as uh, Katja Sharev. She probably knows one of the best how it works in Africa. And that's why it's so educational to learn. And it also gives me a better position to prepare myself when I have to go to, go to Namibia. In, in Iceland, I hold the status of a suspect. And, and there is no protection. And, and it will be a challenge when I have to go to Namibia because, you know, probably the, 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 the bad forces are probably lined up a lot of... Uh, <laughs> A lot of uh, charges, so, and, and but there's also the live risks. Uh, there's one thing here. I, 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 you asked me also about this. Uh, the recent news about the link to the the Dutch company regarding fish rot. If I can a little bit uh, say a few things about that. The thing is with fish rot and with with summary that there is a continuous more leads coming up or information coming up which are uh, you know showing how high corruption is in the fishing industry and we will see more countries be involved um, with summary or partner with summary in europe and i think you know hopefully with this road uh, that will expose more and more because you know there are more and more leads and people start to understand better how this industry works because you know unfortunately Fishing industry, we all look so in uh, as an innocent in industry because as a fisherman, but <laughs> so who knows this uh, industry? It's quite highly corrupt, and uh, there was a OCAT report uh, just what one year ago, which just highlighting the high corruption in the fishing industry. Uh, yeah, I think uh, then you know what's also what I think Katia was talking about. You know, there is uh, this uh, corruption in many of the countries. Uh, let's then talk about Africa. That you know this is constitutional and systematic corruption. And it's very difficult to deal with and, and uh, expose. I right, think. and I think, I think that is what Bill was saying, uh, uh, referring to earlier when he said, you know, in, in, the, in the antitrust cartel world, these are rarely one-off scenarios. These become institutionalized within the company and or within the industry. And, you know, as you said, the fishing industry goes back to Jesus or earlier times, right? If I remember my sort of uh, symbols correctly. Uh, but but uh, in the antitrust world, of course, we've had recently the, the tuna scandal, uh, the, the tuna fisheries, uh, you know, very, very large uh, potential, uh, uh, you know, for cartel behavior, uh, all these trade associations. I wanted to, we, ha we have 10 minutes left. Um, I wanted to get to a couple of questions. And um, Mary, you can address whatever you wish. Uh, I'm sure you have lots of points you want to address. But there is one question directly addressed to you, and I want to read this from a, uh, uh, an audience member, from Sophia El Mansouri. Uh, she said, Mary, how would you usually assist a whistleblower based in Africa, for instance, who may have to resort to UK or US law in the absence of whistleblower protections in their home country? Yes, thank you, Sophia. It's a great question. So um, for me, the answer depends on what the fact situation is. So I can't help all whistleblowers in Africa as much as I would love to. And in fact, 
when I saw, saw Johannes's story, I just wished upon wish that summer he was traded on the US stock exchanges because if it was, the SEC could have come in. So I only have the ability to help African whistleblowers to the extent I can establish a nexus to the United States. But I can tell you is that the SEC in particular with the help of DOJ has been very effective in bringing Foreign Corrupt Practices Act cases that whistleblowers bring to their attention for a lot of what Khadija and others have noted, which is, you know, foreign Western companies coming in, paying bribes to secure business. Um, so we have had a fair amount of success there, but again, the company that needs to be engaged in it has to, at least for the SEC's per perspective, be traded over the counter or on the stock exchanges. So I'm limited in my remit. I sure wish I could expand it. Um, I'm working really closely with the UK government and their efforts to amend their legislation to broaden it to create an office of the whistleblower. Um, I'm cheering Namibian legislation that is actually talking about whistleblower rewards. Johannes and I have talked about that. So the only other way I'm able to be involved is to be lobbying to the legislatures. But there is a big move afoot. Certainly the best uh, news we've heard in a long time is the EU whistleblowing directive which seeks to create a complete, instead of a patchwork quilt, a complete quilt of all um, the same whistleblower protections across Europe. Um, I think that's incredibly important. And we're starting to see, instead of just a reactive retaliation protection regime out of the EU, more concepts of having basically a pool of money, a source of funds for whistleblower aid, things like that. So I feel like we're making progress. The only other points I wanted to raise in, in connection to all of the great topics that people have discussed, I want to inject a little bit of hope here. Um, I know it can seem really, really grim, and I can tell you there's some amazing research being done coming out of uh, Bill Kovacic's own GWU um, from the Graduate Business School teacher there, a guy named Kyle Welch, that we're actually seeing data that will help us affect the cultural change we need that basically says whistleblowers are a CEO's best friends, whistleblowers are good for business. So that kind of data is going to help us move the needle at the point where we really need it to happen, which is if Samer he had just um, listened to Johannes, we wouldn't be here. So I think that's to me a little bit of the happy news that's coming out to Khadija's point about laws that undermine whistleblowers. I think she's absolutely right and to Bill's point as well. You can't just put together a whistleblower reward statute or protection statute. What we do in the United States is that you need to have a, exceptions to protect whistleblowers within the existing le legislation. So for instance, the Trade Secrets Act in the United States has to have an exception because companies have been abusing um, and trying to silence and gag whistleblowers by saying that you're, you, know, you can't speak about this. Uh, my client actually is Tyler Schultz and Tyler Schultz of Theranos who exposed Theranos basically famously said, trade, a fraud is not a trade secret. Um, but yet that is what almost silenced him, right? Because they, um, you know, it's an infamous story now how Theranos went after him and his family basically had to mortgage his home to pay for the attorneys who had to defend him against these claims that he violated confidentiality agreements and things like that. So I think we're making progress, but I think the laws, the criminalization or non-disclosure agreements or other ways of silencing whistleblowers has to change. Um, and then finally, I think there's a tech solution. I know John and Andreas have heard us say this when we put together our COVID hacks for the hackathon. I do think this goes to Khadija's point that we need a cross, uh, cross country and multinational effort. I do think that, I know I'm, I hail from San Francisco originally, so I think tech is always the solution, but we're starting to see the kind of tech that exists that will allow whistleblowers to be, instead of being siloed, to be able to bring information together and basically be allowed to link arms. So we've seen it with the Callisto project coming out of rape on college campuses. They created an escrow, basically escrowing information. So a victim, much like in the Me Too movement, can put their information in a vault to use later to deal with the account of the, of the harm. Um, they don't have to report it. And you can imagine what um, might have happened with the Brett Kavanaugh scandal if, um, I'm forgetting the name of the woman who, who accused him, if she had vaulted her information. But much more importantly, those people are allowed to check a box and say, if we receive additional information from future victims, 
um, would you agree to be linked up with them? I think if we can do that in the whistleblower context, you look at the Boeing whistleblowers, there were 12 of them. If there had been a way where they could have been, instead of being siloed and, and meant, meant to think that they're crazy and you know doubting themselves, if they could have been put together sooner, I think we would have been much better in our results. So I leave you with that little bit of hope. Thank you, Mary. There's there's strength in numbers, in other words. And and as a whistleblower, as Johannes knows, you're usually uh, pretty pretty lonely. So I think I think that's a good point. Also, what you just said, technology, uh, just the concept of the blockchain. I, I, you know, I'm not a tech expert. I dabble a little bit, but that could potentially uh, be leveraged by some tech savvy folks, uh, right? To not only report anonymously, but maybe even be paid. Uh, uh, indirectly without really having to disclose. Of course, there's always the problem of then being a witness and how do you verify that somebody, how do you swear in a witness who's anonymous, right? Uh, in court, for instance. John, um, going to you uh, as a, a sort of final point, uh, si similar question that, that Sophia raised vis-a-vis uh, -vis Mary, uh, how could Mary help? You are based in Africa and Primario is a, a pan-African firm. What, what could you uh, do? Could you assist with, uh, with uh, assisting whistleblowers uh, and giving them protection and potentially uh, recover funds? Look, I mean, I think my big point in relation to what I was discussing earlier on is, unfortunately, there needs to be a bit of political will. Uh, and I do think that one of the issues which you haven't really addressed, I know it's been a cultural issue that uh, Bill discussed and, and Mary discussed and uh, to some degree Khadija, I think that the big lacuna or issue in South Africa has been the lack of a real push for legislative reform to recognize proper awards for, for individuals coming forward. And until that's really taken up, and I'm very sorry that Glynis couldn't join us because Glynis is obviously a bit of an advocate in relation to this and being the, the main opposition in terms of parliament in South Africa, I do think that it necessitates a significant push and a political will to edit our legislation or change our legislation to really make it more attractive from a from an individual's perspective but absolutely i think from helping individuals i think we've got the network we've got the proposals we've got the 